uh, Ranking Member Jackson Lee and distinguished members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting me to testify today. My name is Evan Rachel Wood and I'm an artist, but I am an I am also a uh, domestic violence and sexual assault survivor and the single mother of a young boy. When I was five years old, I started working in film and every day since then I've worked to reach the very privileged place I'm aware that I occupy. And I'm here today to use my position as an artist, survivor, mother, and advocate to bring a human voice to the population of 25 million survivors in the US who are currently experiencing inequality under the law and who desperately need basic civil rights. I struggle to speak to you today because I'm not sure what words are appropriate when discussing this issue. However, if you can't hear the whole truth, you will never know true empathy, and I believe in the saying, if we have to live through it, then you should have to hear it. This past year and the massive movements such as Me Too and Time's Up have been extremely empowering and validating for survivors, but also incredibly painful. While no one had to tell me that rape was such a worldwide epidemic, to see the flood of stories so similar to my own was both freeing and soul-crushing. Waves of memories and detail came flooding into my brain every time I read the words, I froze. I thought I was the only human who experienced this and I carried so much guilt and confusion about my response to the abuse. I accepted my powerlessness and I felt I deserved it somehow. Why? There are two specific instances of sexual assault and violence I've experienced that really stick out in my mind. In fact, they are burned into my brain, branded there for life, a mental scar that I feel every day. My experience with domestic violence was this. Toxic mental, physical, and sexual abuse which started slow but escalated over time, including threats against my life, severe gaslighting and brainwashing, waking up to the man that claimed to love me raping what he believed to be my unconscious body. And the worst part, sick rituals of binding me up by my hands and feet to be mentally and physically tortured until my abuser felt I had proven my love for them. In this moment, while I was tied up in being beaten and being told unspeakable things, I truly felt like I could die, not just because my abuser said to me, I could kill you right now, but because in that moment, I felt like I left my body and I was too afraid to run, he would find me. I froze, and it was as if I could see myself from the outside, and for the first time in months, I felt something, utter shame and despair. I had no idea what to do to change my situation, so I went numb, and soon I couldn't feel anything. I wasn't alive. My self-esteem and spirit were broken. I was deeply terrified, and that fear lives with me to this day. What makes me more hurt and more angry than the actual rape and abuse itself was that piece of me that was stolen which altered the course of my life. Because of this abuse, my already spiritless person, when I was pushed onto the floor of a locked storage closet by another attacker after hours at a bar, my body instinctively knew what to do. Disappear, go numb, make it go away. Being abused and raped previously made it easier for me to be raped again, not the other way around. And not a day goes by when I don't hear the words this man whispered into my ear over and over, you're gonna be fine, you're gonna be fine, you're gonna be fine. And then my small voice sang back, no, 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 until it faded into nothing. And I remember the feeling of shutting down or freezing and utter shock taking over and I couldn't even make a sound. I felt a piece of me disappear, a piece that has never returned. In other words, I was not fine and I am not fine. I was told the signs, my mother is also a survivor, but even she couldn't protect her daughter from the messages women and men are fed by society that plays a role in determining our fate or the dark magic of gaslighting. Sometimes we are pushed down not just by our attackers, but held there by the knowledge that there may be no safe place to go. The aftermath of rape is a huge part of the conversation that needs much more attention, and in this case, I can speak from my own experiences. So often we speak of these assaults as no more than a few minutes of awfulness, but the scars last a lifetime. Even though these experiences happened a decade ago, I still struggle with the aftermath. My relationship suffers, my partners suffer, my mental and physical health suffers. Seven years after my rapes, plural, I was diagnosed with long-term PTSD, which I had been living with all that time without knowledge about my condition. I simply thought I was going crazy. I struggled with depression, addiction, agoraphobia, night terrors. So many times a sleeping partner of mine has awoken to their love screaming in the night and gasping for air in a pool of sweat after having some sort of vivid dream of my abuse or hearing them say my name so loudly in my ear. The feeling of paralysis returns when there's a loud noise and I'm home alone, convinced someone is coming to hurt me. I stay awake all night clutching a baseball bat, which began to replace my distraught and absent partners as trust and touch became increasingly more difficult. 
I struggled with self-harm to the point of two suicide attempts, which landed me in a psychiatric hospital for a short period of time. And this was, however, a turning point in my life when I started seeking professional help to deal with my trauma and mental stress. But others are not so fortunate, and because of this, rape is often more than a few minutes of trauma, but a slow death. And I would like to say to my attackers that I don't hate you. I feel sorry for you. I'm not here to shame you. I want to understand you, and I want you to understand me, but you have to listen first. And this makes me think of my son and the world that he will be raised in and the day I will have to explain to him what rape means and why it happened to his mother. And when I knew I was to become a mother, I prayed for a boy for this reason. However, I realized it could be just as easy for my son to fall prey to the lies society tells us about men. Things like they have uncontrollable impulses to hurt people. And I think that it's cruel to tell a child that this is just how all men are. And it's cruel to turn a blind eye to all the ways we perpetuate this lie. So I'm also here to advocate for men and for my son, who I hope grows up knowing he's much more valuable than that and who I can only hope I will set an example for by continuing to fight for him and myself and all the people affected by a blues because that is our job as parents and as leaders. And above all, this starts with the rule of law and it starts with people leading by example and coming to the aid of our girls, but also our young boys. And that's why I sit here today with Amanda Nguyen and members of the RISE team. Amanda has been so inspiring to me and energized me and made me realize that not only was change possible, that I could play a part in it. And this bill is just one step in the right direction of setting the bar higher for what's right and what the standard will be that we set for society. This is the recognition of basic civil rights for sexual assault survivors serves as a first step. It's a safety net that may help save someone's life one day. And even though we pass this bill at a federal level, there's still work to be done. And in order to ensure that all survivors are protected under that law, we need to pass the Sexual Assault Survivor Bill of Rights in all 50 states. We've done this in nine so far, and it's our job to make sure that survivors in the remaining 41 are treated with the same humanity and dignity. And this is called progress, and it starts here. Thank you.